everyone. Welcome. It's a, a, a real pleasure to see you all here. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging that we're all gathering here today on traditional Vinod territory. Um, we have, as you know, as many of you know, many excellent, excellent lecture series at the law school. And this one, the Reed Lecture Series, is the one of longest standing. It's quite something that we're gathering today for the 40th Reed Lecture. That's quite something, I think, for a lecture series to have um, lasted uh, and continued for that period of time. Um, it's uh, in honor of uh, Horace Reed. Um, he was the dean of the law school from 1950 to 1964. He was many other things as well. And this lecture series was uh, set up uh, in cooperation with the uh, Reed family and the law school to honor Horace Reed and his memory and legacy. Um, we're very pleased to have some members of the Reed family here today. Uh, Dr. Robert Reed, um, Ms. Michelle Raymond, Mr. Russell McKinnon, and Dr. Judy Reed Guernsey. And um, it's great that they have continued to support this lecture series. Uh, so welcome the Reed families. We're really delighted to have you here. Um, some of you will know a little bit of Horace Reed's life, so I'll just give you a few details so we know the person after whom um, this lecture series that has brought us here today is named. Um, he had a rich academic life and a rich life in public service. He enlisted during the First World War. He served as chair of the Regulations Revision Committee with the Royal Canadian Navy during the Second World War. Uh, as a longtime member of the Nova Scotia Labor Relations Board, a longtime member of the Conference of Governing Bodies of the Legal Profession and the Conference of Commissions on the Uniformity of Legislation, honorary president of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, 66 to 67, and as Canadian delegate to the Conference on Private International Law at The Hague in 1968. He's remembered for um, his life of public service, uh, but he's all, he was also remembered as a great teacher. Um, and uh, this is an excerpt that was uh, written about him in the Halifax Herald in 1975. Horace Emerson Reed, OC, OBE, QC, BA, LLB, LLM, SJD, LLD, that's a lot of letters, <laughs> former dean of Dalhousie Law School and a legal scholar and law teacher, taught law with all of the authority of a profound and mature scholar of international renown. But he also brought to his teaching the benevolence and humanity, which were among his most admirable qualities. Kindly and affable, readily available to students and colleagues alike, he presided as dean over a lengthy period of unparalleled expansion and development in the faculty of law, and marked it firmly with his philosophy and objectives. Uh, and in recognition of all of his achievements, Dr. Reed is, was appointed Officer of the Order of Canada in 1973. He also had honorary degrees from Acadia, Queens, Dalhousie, and the University of Windsor. He began teaching in Minnesota, but gradually saw the light and came back to Dalhousie. Of course, we're delighted that he came. Um, and now I'll introduce our guest today, Professor Annalisa Riles. Um, and here I'm just going to put in a, a, a little plug for Kim Brooks, when I sent a note around asking for suggestions, Kim, I think it might have been you who proposed <laughs> Professor Ryle, so uh, I'm delighted. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. Um, so uh, Professor Ryle is with us to deliver this 40th. A, a remarkable bio. I like reading it. I've read it several times just for the sake of reading it. Uh, so I'm going to say a few things about it. I guess what I like about it is that it's so remarkably interdisciplinary across the law and social sciences. Um, which, which really is um, impressive, and which I think really is in the spirit of the Reed Lecture and what it's supposed to be about. So Annalisa Riles is the Jack G. Clark Professor of Law in Far East Legal Studies and Professor of Anthropology at Cornell University. She's the founder and director of Meridian 180, a transnational platform for policy solutions. I think that's amazing and interesting. Her work focuses on the transnational dimensions of law, markets, and culture, across the fields of private law, conflict of laws, financial regulation, and comparative legal studies. She has conducted legal and anthropological research in China, Japan, and the Pacific, and speaks Chinese, Japanese, French, and Fijian, uh, and English. She has published on a wide variety of topics, including comparative law, conflict of laws, financial regulation, and central banking. Her first book, The Network Inside Out, won the American Society of International Laws Certificate of Merit, 
She has served as a visiting, visiting professor at Yale University, University of Tokyo, London School of Economics, and the University of Melbourne. And she's been a visiting researcher at the Bank of Japan. Her most recent book is The Changing Politics of Central Banking. Uh, she's currently working on a book about the possibility for transnational democratic dialogue in times of geopolitical conflict. Always topical. Uh, based on the experience of Meridian 180. Her latest research concerns the transnational data governance regime. She writes about these and other issues on her blog, and if you go to her website, you'll see a link to her blog. And so it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Professor Riles. The title is The Sociality of the Platform, Reimagining the Digital Public Sphere. Over to you, Professor Riles. Over this very carefully. Well, thank you so much, Dean Cameron, for this lovely invitation, for this lovely introduction. I really appreciate, of course, uh, being here. Um, I don't know how many of you know my co author on many papers, Karen Knopp, who's a graduate of this law school. But uh, Karen and I have been working together for uh, 15 years, and I've heard many, many things about Halifax and always wanted to come. So it's wonderful to be here um, with all of you today. Um, this uh, is uh, really, I'm, I'm speaking today with a great deal of trepidation because it's the first time I've spoken about <coughs> this project publicly in a law school environment. So I thought that you all were really nice people and it would give me a <laughs> chance to <laughs> kind of try it out. So this is all very much in the experimental uh, mode. Um, okay, so, so 20 years ago, new uh, digital technologies were heralded as engines of a new era of public discourse. So I remember, I think we all remember in the 90s, the sense that life was really going to change and become much more democratic. They would allow social activists to escape, if you let me stand up here so you can see that, uh, to escape from the, um, from the iron cage of bureaucracy, weaken our reliance on old institutions in terms of our political activism and our funding for activism and so forth. People used phrases like, post-bureaucratic organizing or organizing without having to organize you know, because of the internet. Um, and although there have been Arab Springs, um, clearly there's been another side to this. This is not the whole picture. Um, far from bringing rationality to public discourse and enabling connections across public divides, um, digitized conversation has become largely something of a free speech free-for-all, um, radicalizing passions and amplifying, amplifying charismatic authority and leading to greater balkanization of the public sphere. So certainly those of you who are, uh, have the privilege of watching all this from across our border and not having it be your personal problem, I envy you, but I think for many of us it's quite traumatic to see what's happening to our politics now in the United States. So. Um, um, and so it seems that this digitization of the public sphere has ushered in a, a really new, almost post-democratic ethos, far from being the engine of democratization, a post-democratic ethos in which mm -hmm. the internet platform becomes a way to actually undermine democracy rather than support democracy. And, and this really fits with what a lot of sociologists and science and technology studies scholars and anthropologists who study social media platforms like these have been saying for some time now about these platforms, um, which is in part um, focusing quite a bit on um, the economics of these platforms and the facts that um, all of us, uh, probably every single one of us in here, including myself, is very engaged on a number of these platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or what have you, or, or Airbnb or Uber or any of these platforms, but they seem the anthropologists have described them as increasingly becoming what one anthropologist called sociality factories and markets, places where people are engaged as laborers in producing content about themselves and producing themselves really as data to be bought and sold by others and marketed. And so, um, and so that there is not just a political story here but an economic story. And so this is very much less optimistic, I guess, than where we started in the 90s. Now, in legal studies, um, the debate has, I'd say, pretty much tracked what um, I've just described in the social sciences. So early on, there was a great deal of euphoria. This is Yochai Benkler, um, uh, now at Harvard, 
who um, was really very excited, and many were excited like him about what would come of these new technologies. But that was soon followed by a great deal of pessimism um, from uh, people like Cass Sunstein, who's talked about the fact that the, it's, he calls it the, the daily me generation, where you know, it's all about getting content about yourself and the, your view of things and the way you want things to be, and never really having to hear actually anything different from what you want to hear. Or Jack Balkin also, who's talked a lot about, again, like the anthropologists, the question of the consumer model of conversation, in which we are all consumers or producers of information rather than citizens in a conversation. Um, and of course, not everybody, oops, this thing is going nuts on me here. Hold on. Of course, not everyone um, rem, uh, is, is negative on this. Um, uh, Yochai Benkla remains quite optimistic that in certain cases, at least, these platforms can become sites of real democratic activity. And he gives some concrete examples of that happening uh, with good, with what I guess what many of us would call good results. Um, but uh, there is nevertheless a great deal of pessimism. And so now the conversation in the law world is focusing on the implications of this for the regulation of speech. Do we need to think differently about how we regulate speech, uh, given that it, speech itself seems to be changing in some ways? Um, and so we have here kind of two main positions, very crude. I'm sure many of you who teach constitutional law can fill this in in much more interesting ways. But just to get it out there, um, a, a libertarian view that says, you know what? So what if it's consumeristic? It's a freedom, a freedom of speech is a fundamental right, just like freedom of religion. Let the chips fall where they may. And on the other side, uh, a more Republican or deliberative democracy view that says, no, speech isn't just an end in itself. It's a means to an end. That end is self-government or collective self-determination. And so we have to think about the ways that some speech can have silencing effect on others. For example, by taking away their dignity. Jack Balkin talks about this quite a bit, the idea that some of this speech coming out of, say, places like Breitbart in the United States is taking away the dignity of African Americans or other minorities in the United States and therefore keeping them from speaking. And that in those cases, perhaps we need to think about how we're going to regulate this. Do we need some way to regulate it? And so uh, people like Balkan and Cass Sunstein have said that the goal is really to create citizens, not consumers. And do we need to begin to think about how to change the way speech happens in the digital public sphere, so it's focusing more on citizens and not consumers. OK, so that's kind of the framework uh, that we're operating in. I think there's a few limitations to this conversation in the law world as it's played out so far. One is that, as, as you can hear, it's actually very state-focused. The question is, uh, sh what should the state do about speech, first of all? We're talking about state regulation. And secondly, the reason the state would want to do something is to fix the problem of citizens in the state, how to make us have better states, because citizens have to play their role in a democracy so that they're not overtaken by demagogues and so forth, right? So, so very state-focused. That's one thing. Second thing is not, surprisingly, not very transnational in the way they're talking, right? Little awareness that one of the things that's really new and important about this digital public sphere is that it's no longer a local or domestic public sphere, that it's very transnational in its orientation. And certainly, if you just think of what happened in the US election, the way that a lot of the speech was coming from outside the United States, you'd think that would be coming quite obvious to us now. So not very transnational. And, um, and then critical scholars in, in the humanities and um, social theory who've talked about, whoops, I don't know what that is. Sorry about that. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, who've talked about freedom of speech um, are, um, the critical scholars who've talked about this um, have been quite critical about how lawyers' conversation, the conversation I described, is quite narrow in its focus. So um, Judith Butler has talked about the fact that this whole conversation that law professors are having presupposes a particular kind of subject who does the speaking and the listening, which is a very, um, you know, it's just one model of what a subject is. It's not even the only model in the United States, let alone in other countries. Or Talal Assad, a very important um, social theorist, uh, has talked about the European choice to allow defamation of the prophet Muhammad 
um, as taking away the humanity of European Muslims and therefore keeping them from speech, speaking. And he talks about how um, the freedom of expression, free speech talk, becomes its own cultural dogma and its way of excluding people. So, in other words, what they're, they're saying is that there's a lack of self-consciousness among law professors about the cultural foundations of the entire free speech conversation. And, um, and the question that raises for me is, might there be other ways altogether for us to think about digital deliberation that might raise other le regulatory challenges to our minds or that might pr pr suggest other ways of thinking about how to solve the problems that we are facing now. So that's, the, that's where I'm coming from. So I come at all this, as, um, as Dean Cameron said, as both an international law scholar and as an anthropologist. And so I'm interested in it from both sides. So as an international law scholar, um, my first project um, was on, on uh, international legal institutions, and I got interested in networks, the phenomenon of networks, which was everywhere in around circa 2000 when I published my book. Everybody had a network, everybody participated in a network, and in international law, these networks were really the new hot form of social organization or for ways of thinking about problems. And I was interested in studying these um, anthropologically as forms of thought, as models or templates for the way people worked, and, um, and um, to understand basically what was the fantasy, what was the appeal um, you know, of this form that seemed to be dominating uh, international law at that time, circa 2000. What's interesting to me is that networks have kind of ceased to be the hot thing now. Now, a lot of the talk is about platforms. And so what I'm interested in is thinking about the platform in much the way that I talked about, ne thought about networks. So that's from my law side, and especially international law. I'm thinking about platforms in international, international spaces. As an anthropologist um, and a sociolegal scholar, I'm interested in um, rethinking the normative legal debate about free speech regulation. So um, there hasn't been that much social science that law professors have done on free speech. Yohai Benkler, who I mentioned, has done just some empirical work aimed at showing that he is right, that there can be positive outcomes to speech. But I mean, I think the more interesting question for social scientists is not whether he's right or wrong, or whether can there can be good outcomes or bad outcomes, um, but um, what are the unstated assumptions in the normative debate? Um, what else, uh, not, not is regulation good or bad, but how, how does, uh, how, what is the appeal of these things? Why are people deliberating online? How are they deliberating online? What are the outcomes? And sort of look at this concretely at, through ethnography. So that's the second way. And I should say there's a third way that I, reason I'm interested in this. It's more as a human being and as a political and ethical subject. Um, I, like everyone else at the moment, am feel that I have to think of how I can engage and what I can do about the situation that we're now facing. And, um, and um, the project I'm going to describe, therefore, today is a departure from the kind of standard empirical project that I've done in, for my entire career, in the sense that it involves an experiment with a form of political intervention. It's not just describing something or documenting what other people are doing. I'm not just studying Facebook. I'm trying to work with a bunch of like-minded academics to see whether we can experiment with finding new solutions and what some, what a, what is there any possible uh, imagination of this digital space that we could call positive that we might want to try out and see what it looks like. So. That's a little bit unusual and controversial, I guess, in social science to be involved in that way. Um, but that's, we can talk more about that if you like. So now what I'm going to do is take you into the world of the project that I've been involved in and talk about that for a little while. And then we can come back and think about some of the implications for the free speech debate. OK. So, um, so, um, so the project is called Meridian 180. And it was born out of um, a crisis. Um, in uh, 2011, I was doing field work in Japan at the Bank of Japan, and of course we had uh, an earthquake followed by a terrible tsunami, followed by a nuclear accident. And this created um, a great deal of, it, it was really not just, it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a, obviously a humanitarian crisis, 
It was also an economic crisis, a political crisis, but for many of us it was also a kind of uh, epistemological or, or ethical crisis. The question was, how could this happen? How could things get this bad? How? Here we are in Japan, right? Someone said to me, this is in Indonesia, which I mean, we could go with whether that, what I wanted to make of that comment, but the idea being, we thought we could trust the system, right? How could this happen? And that led a lot of the people that I was working with as a scholar, who were regulators and policy makers and academics, to say, boy, is there anything I could have done or should have done to avoid this terrible disaster? And what will be the next disaster? What will it look like? And will I have done all I can do to make sure that we're not in this situation again? And so as we began talking about what the problems were, there was a sense um, that um, one of the issues was intellectual silos, a sense that the nuclear regulators were talking to the regulators and the activists were talking to the activists and the social science were talking to the lawyers were talking to the lawyers and there was very little cross conversations wh which could have revealed what some of the problems were. And also that the conversation transnationally was very thin. The nuclear reactor had been built by an American company, General Electric. The nuclear radiation was going to other countries like Korea and eventually the United States and elsewhere. You know, the and, and, and yet there was no way to deal with that transnational dimension. So the sense was, well, okay, perhaps we need to prepare for the next crisis by thinking about a way in which we could have deep and um, uh, searching and challenging conversations across all those divides. And what would that kind of conversation look like? So here's just a mission statement from the group. Um, whoops, sorry. It's a, the group describing some of the concerns that they had, and, and we formed this group called Meridian 180. Meridian 180 is the, it's the name of the 180th uh, Meridian, the international date line. It separates east from west, right? So this idea that there needed to be a conversation between east and west. But it's also, I don't know if, if there are any sea, uh, uh, people involved in seafaring, if you have any of that in your family, you probably know that Meridian 180 is also considered mythologically to be a place where strange things happen. So when, when, uh, so when uh, seafarers cross the 180th Meridian, they'll do funny things like stand on their head, or there's a, all kinds of myths of that. Strange, strange ideas coming to you in this space. And so we thought this could be, it stood for the idea that we were going to think differently about things as well. Um, and um, so and so the, the idea was, um, uh, to, you know, to s of course, because we're talking with about people who are very busy and in different parts of the world and have different languages that they use and so forth, that we might be able to harness new technologies to do that. Now, at this point, we have 800 and over 850 members in 35 countries, and, um, and we hold online forums, which is some of the forums that we've had. This is not a complete list, but online forums that go on every month on different topics. Um, uh, and, um, and then live conferences and so on. Here's just an example of what's going on on the site right now. Here's a, a conversation uh, started by our Korean team, which is about putting yourself in the shoes of the people who are surrounding the leadership in North Korea and trying to think, instead of thinking about how it from our point of view, thinking about it from their point of view and thinking how what would be one's options if one were them, and therefore what could one do about it? So that's an example of the kind of different thinking that goes on. Um, now, from the beginning, this was really an experiment in not being Facebook. That's what everybody <laughs> thought of, wanted, they wanted to do. So we set up a number of structural features that were supposed to prevent this from becoming that kind of free speech free-for-all. One is um, the conversations are multilingual, so getting rid of the hegemony of English, something I know you Canadians are way ahead of us on, but you know, understanding that. Um, and also something we didn't anticipate about that was that the, the fact that people knew that someone was translating their speech meant that they understood that their speech had better be serious because it was going to take somebody a great deal of time to translate it. And so the quality was became very different. People don't um, people put some thought into it. The other feature was the conversations were completely private and not quotable outside of the conversation. So less grandstanding for that reason and more risk taking was the hope. The third members carefully chosen through, that is, I don't know everyone, but 
someone who's come into the group knows someone, everyone else, so that there would be some sort of social accountability. And um, of course, uh, the idea that it would be not-for-profit, so this is funded by a consortium of universities uh, who serve as bases and cover the costs and do the translation. So the idea being that it would not be, um, not, be uh, not have profit motive. And finally, that the governance would be diffused, that it would be shared across people from different countries and therefore, and different disciplines, and so respect dif uh, reflect different points of view. Now, for the first few years of this project's existence, um, the participants really didn't know how to describe themselves. Somebody said, what is Meridian 180? Everyone kind of panicked and didn't know what to quite what to say. Um, was it a think tank or was it a community? Or, and um, at an early meeting of the leadership group, which is called the Core Idea Group, people pondered what metaphors to use. And I remember possibilities proposed included amateur think tank or guerrilla consulting group or one black box theater performance or my personal favorite, intellectual gym, a place that people could go to kind of just get train up and get some new ideas side by side with strangers and then leave. <laughs> Um, but at a meeting um, of the leadership in 2016, the question was revol resolved. After trying on a whole bunch of different possible ways of describing ourselves, somebody said, we're a platform. And then this I, flash of recognition went across the group. And um, one leader with links to the tech economy, a, an entrepreneur, said, a platform, a platform, we're a platform. At light, and he tried it on all these different voices, like he thought that just totally fit. Um, and, um, and there was just consensus immediately on this term platform. So what did they mean by platform? Why was this so appealing? And I think this is important anthropologically as data about why this term appeals. So people said things like, institutions are older, they're less flexible, they're more locally grounded, where platforms rely on new information technologies to cross distances and borders of all kinds. Platforms, it was also remarked, are distinct from communities, which seem more old-fashioned. So the appeal of the platform as a modality of techno-sociality was that it was supposed to bring together all kinds of differences, people from different language groups, people from different political views, people with different expertise, by filtering and somehow organizing conversations technologically in a way that would be impossible in real life. So this seems to be a feature of the, w of the appeal of this idea of the platform now, that, um, that uh, it brings together many diverse elements, institutions, funding, intellectual property, people, technologies. And, and now platforms ha have become even sources of wealth. Uh, people buy, I met a guy in Hong Kong recently who was telling me, oh, I buy and sell platforms. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I buy the whole thing. I buy the people, I buy the know-how, I buy the institutions, I buy the whole thing, and I sell it to somebody else. So they've become even commodities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so the other thing is that what platforms are for is often very open-ended. They're thought of as a technology, a means to an end, but what they're really for is, is kind of open-ended. So, Point number one that I want to make here is that this platform idea seems to be emerging as an important model of social organization, not just in one country, but in many countries. Something that's capturing people's imaginations that maybe we should pay attention to. So, sorry, so, um, so one of the ways that I would pay attention to it is by comparing it to uh, something I studied before, which is the network. So here's a diagram from my earlier book of, of something someone had made of what a network looks like, the people that I was working with at the United Nations. And when you think about the network as a phenomenon of international law versus the platform as an emerging phenomenon, there's some similarities. They're both supposed to cross distances. Um, they're both supposed to manage an incredible heterogeneity of viewpoints of, of people and so forth. But there are also differences. Um, in theory, networks was, were supposed to be infinitely extendable. So the fantasy about networks, as I wrote about it in around 2000, was that activists thought we could just keep growing our networks. Anyone can participate. More and more people can get involved. It's like, it's just, it's gonna, anyone can get involved. Whereas platforms are really quite exclusive. The, it's the opposite mentality. It's, a platform is not for everyone. And so, in my mind, one of the things we can say about this is that this whole fascination with digital deliberation and platforms 
is represents already a darker worldview than we had around 2000, which was in 2000 we had a faith that we all could connect up. Now we seem to have lost that faith, that we're, we're already seeing ourselves in more limited groups. So the appeal of you know, small groups on Facebook or you know, this idea that you want to connect with certain people by let keeping other people out. The other thing that's different about networks and platforms, this by the way is a diagram that our law school um, uh, communications team produced of what it is that I'm doing. And I just think ethnographic, as a data point, it's fascinating to me, you know, because these are people in the business of marketing things, and I think the person who made it used to work at a Gap or something. So here's her image of what it is. And so you can see already a very different style from 2000 in terms of how people think about things. Um, so the other thing about platforms, you kind of see this in the diagram, is they have an infrastructural quality. The network was just supposed to kind of happen on its own. And a lot of the critiques that people like me had of networks as they were talked about is, wait a minute, it doesn't just happen on its own. It takes a lot of resources to have a network. Whereas this thing is all about focusing on the technology, on the infrastructure. It's actually fascinating, almost fetishizing the technology itself. Um, the digital is really the focal point. It's like the secret sauce, the machine is what we want to know. How does Facebook do it, the technology? So let's talk a little bit about the technology in the Meridian Project and see what we can unpack, since that seems to be what fascinates people, and see what we can make of that. And this, is, by the way, is a classic anthropological move. We're going to go beyond what Meridian says about itself, which is all the beautiful stuff I talked about already, and now think, kind of look in the back room and see what's going on. Um, so, um, so at the base, at the center of this thing is a digital platform for multilingual online conversation that we built. It was originally built by this guy who was a, an out-of-work PhD in um, medieval literature, <laughs> uh, working with these people who are kind of artisanal software people in Ithaca, New York, this kind of hippie town, right? And they built this thing together and um, for like no money. And it was like really rickety and always breaking down and could never, you know, was always never working and was kind of pieced <laughs> together by these guys. And eventually sputtered and stopped and fell apart. And in the last year, most of Meridian 180's activity has been focused on this problem of rebuilding the platform. So we just launched a new digital platform, and this is considered by the Meridian community as an incredible accomplishment, a huge feat. And um, it involved many different dimensions, technological feat, how to have, how to harness new digital translation technologies so that we could translate quicker and more efficiently and involve more languages. And this was built by a bunch of really smart computer scientists in Berkeley, California, um, who are inside a company. So again, not these people anymore, much more corporate. Second, a financial feat. This was turned out to be incredibly expensive. Raising the money, getting the people to do this, getting all the institutions to share the costs. You know, you can't imagine, hours and hours and hours. Third, relate to this, here's just a, I'm just a picture of our, just give you some idea, it's constant to-dos. The organizational or logistical feat of this project, multiple teams in many countries working together to make it happen. There were legal issues, there were branding issues, there were tons of organizational challenges, there were staffing problems. So it finally happened. Now, what can we, what is the point of this? Um, the point is, this is hardly organizing without organizing, or what was it, you know, whatever it was that th we said in the 90s about what this was going to be like. On the contrary, it takes a whole bureaucracy behind the scenes to run something like this. And tons of very traditional institutional problems, like how do universities cooperate, the kinds of things that you probably work on all day long. How do departments cooperate? How do you get people to buy into working together? You know, how do you get everyone to share resources? Very, very traditional, nothing fancy, nothing new fangled at all, something very, very old fashioned behind all this. La second point is, as the story suggests, hardly a magical technology that just has a secret sauce that makes things happen. On the contrary, a world full of constant glitches, turf battles, misunderstandings, people who have to be hired, people who have to be fired. Um, meetings missed due to time zone confusion, emails that end up in people's spam folders that never get to anyone, technologies that break down or that people don't like to use. So in other words, the point is it's not magic at all. It's actually very, very uh, rickety still. Um, 
So, but the third thing that I would say about this is something that was really unexpected to me, that I never could have imagined sitting in my office theorizing about this had I not been through it, which is that all of these to-dos, all of these messages, all these documents that have to be produced and files and emails somehow bring people together. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, one team that's been working on this project involves a lawyer in Singapore, a lawyer in Brussels, um, a graduate student in London, um, and um, a computer scientist in Ithaca. And they've been working very, very hard for a year as volunteers, uh, in the case of three of them, and uh, paid in the case of the computer scientists, on this project, donating their time. These are people who had never really met in person. I think they finally met once. Completely different stages in life, completely different status. Um, uh, the most unlikely group. And what's been really totally surprising to me is to see these people speak in really almost, uh, you know, pseudo-spiritual terms about the meaning of the relationships that they've developed among the, this group of unlikely people. So this idea that, fr and they talk about friendship, and they talk about their loneliness, in their li how few friends they actually have, and the fact that what this has meant for them is that they've been, had the, you know, the serendipitous opportunity to become friends with somebody they never would have been friends with before. So when I asked this lawyer in Singapore, you know, you're such a busy guy, why are you doing this? And he says, I could never have friendships like this otherwise. So that's what his commitment is about. Friendships is what people, who you can see this group, that they just founded this new office in Seoul and how happy they are. So <laughs> friendships, um, friendships uh, seems to be what people think they're getting out of it. And this is puzzling to me, not what I expected, but as an anthropologist, I want to take it seriously. Now, friendship, so let's talk about friendship for a second. So friendship is something that's really hard to talk about in social science. <laughs> Um, we, ha we as anthropologists can talk about consumers, we can talk about citizens, we can talk about family, what we call kinship, we can talk about members of social movements, but we don't really have much of a way of talking about friends. We don't know what to say about friends. And I think it's even harder for lawyers to talk about friendship. I, I can't think of any good <laughs> legal theory of friendship. <laughs> Certainly the whole debate about <laughs> citizenship or online, uh, free speech on the internet never thinks about friendship as a category. And it's certainly not a category in international law either, although now that I'm thinking about it, I think you could trace a whole history of international law in terms of actual friendships and the meaning of friendships um, and wh where they are. <coughs> but the irony is that friendship is the ex actual word that the whole s social networking site is already using to describe itself, right? So this idea of adding friends and being friends. Um, and, um, and of course, when you know, something like Facebook or LinkedIn talks about friendship, they're talking about instrumentalizing your friends, profiting from your friends, or increasing your friends for some instrumental purpose, to get a better job or something like that. But that's not the only way that we're talking about friendship today. I read in the newspaper uh, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, maybe some of you saw, that, um, that the British government has just appointed a new uh, assistant minister for loneliness. for loneliness. And this idea that people's lack of friendship has become a, a social problem that people can really recognize. So it seems like there's some currency to this problem of friendship. Um, and of course we should be rightly critical of this kind of empty online consumeristic instrumentalizing exploitation of people's desire for friendship. And in fact I also saw this week that the guy who invented the like button on uh, Facebook, the, the computer scientist himself said that he will never use it again, that it's a kind of drug. He talked about it as a drug because people so much want to be liked that they're, they'll, you know, that when they post something they're constantly checking back to see if anybody liked them. You know, and I think, but, but I think as a social phenomenon it's very interesting. It suggests how serious this loneliness problem is. Um, but notice that where, where is friendship appearing in my story? It's not actually in the conversations on the platform, the Korean dialogue. It's actually in the work of making the platform that people come to feel that they're friends. It's the backstage stuff that seems to me most important. And notice that the friendship is coming about not by anything new that people are doing, but very old-fashioned bureaucratic stuff. 
working together to solve practical problems that could be exactly the same kind of problems we would solve in this room together. Nothing special about the online dimensions. But what is new is that the technology has needs. It's not a perfect, on the contrary, it's, it's a broken technology. And because the platform has needs, it's rickety, it needs to be fixed, people have to fix it. And the people who have to fix it come to have a basis for connecting with one another. Okay, so let's bring all this back to free speech. Um, so um, as anthropologists know, one of the best ways to think about social practices and their regulation is through cases of conflict. So a lot of the anthropology of law is about particular cases of conflict. So what I'm going to do is tell you a story Ooh. of a case of conflict within Meridian 180 about free speech and free, uh, you know, freestyle free speech and see um, what we can make of it. So some time ago, the postdoctoral fellows who are involved in the project came to me. You know, they're very idealistic and um, <laughs> still believe in, that in solving problems. So they came to me and said, that our group did not reflect the full political spectrum, that we were all basically a bunch of center leftists talking to each other. And that if we really wanted to be the radical group that we said we wanted to be, we needed to bring in some of those right-wing nationalist people and the ones who seemed to be threatening us and have a dialogue with them. So I thought about this and I thought, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so we started searching for the right candidates. And as it happened, through my dean and his donor connections, I was introduced to the ideal candidate. That's how we law professors meet such people. So, and um, he was a high-ranking member of the political staff of the Republican Coalition in the United States in Congress, and somebody who was directly responsible for making U.S. policy towards Asia, who held both a law degree and a doctorate in political science focusing on China. And if that's not enough for you, he was also claimed to be a Zen monk and a former Navy commander. We were like, this is too good to be true. So we invited him to join the membership and he accepted. Now, his first few posts were, as expected, brilliant, creative, on point, fantastic. Then, in a conversation on a totally different topic, he launched into an inflammatory attack on the corrupt and oligarchic nature of the Chinese government and of the intellectuals from China in our group. We have a very large group of Chinese participants who he said were all on the government, Chinese government payroll and so should be dismissed out of hand. Now, remarkably, nothing like this had ever happened before and actually has never happened again. Um, and the Chinese member who is in our leadership group, or the core idea group, really panicked, uh, a law professor. He panicked, and he said this was going to make members in China very uncomfortable. They were going to withdraw from the project because people would start to suspect that this was a covert U.S. nationalist project in s of some form. Um, but really what bothered the anthropologists who were in the leadership group was that it seemed like this guy left no room for the other side to intervene or respond, that he wasn't really interested in talking to them. He was about talking about them to people who already agreed with him. So the incident seemed to expose in its violation some deeply held, held normative commitment of the group that one at least could say what everyone wanted, but one said it in a way that allowed other people to respond. So the free speech, free for all. So, they, so the group delegated to me the responsibility to call this guy up. So the next morning I, I phoned him and asked him if he would revise his post. And I explained that I wanted him, here I still was thinking that the digital technology itself was the problem. So I wanted him to visualize the Chinese members as if they were in a room with him and ask him if in a non-digital environment like this one, he would have made the point in exactly the same way. And I pointed out that while many of our Chinese members probably actually agreed with his criticisms of the Chinese state, that it would be awkward, if not impossible, for them to participate in the conversation if he framed it in that way. And he responded swiftly and angrily. In his view, he said, this was a matter of free speech. He had a right to say what he wanted to say, and he did not want to participate in the habit of U.S. sinologists of what he called self-censorship in order to avoid offending Chinese sensibilities. He accused me of U.S. bias, anti-U.S. bias, and um, as I tried to entice him to think about how he could maybe have a more interesting conversation if he changed his terms, he would have none of it. Um, he said, quote, I participate in six or seven listservs where Chinese members spout nationalist propaganda and I'm expected to behave like a gentleman. And at that point I wondered what had happened to his Zen training, but anyway. <laughs> um, when we ended the call, he made some very minor revisions and um, resubmitted the piece defiantly. Now within its own logic, this guy's argument made perfect sense. It's the, it's the libertarian view that I started with, this idea of free speech as a fundamental right, come what may. 
Um, and no matter the consequences to some laboriously created community that you might be participating in. Um, and this set off an intensive debate in the leadership of Meridian 180 about what to do about it. Um, and there were a lot of different points of view, but ultimately the group felt that Meridian 180 was an experiment in taking risks with deliberation, and that it was important to take the risk, to allow the dangerous situation to happen, and to see what could come of this rather than to regulate this guy. So, so we just held our breath and we let his post go forward. And what happened next was completely surprising to me. Other members stepped in. So um, uh, a Korean member who is himself uh, chief economic advisor to the presidential candidate of Korea, so he was kind of a politician, immediately understood what was going on and deftly changed the subject. And then our Chinese members, who we thought were going to either drop out of the project or respond in similar tone, actually just ignored him and kept on talking about other things. They ignored him. And this was absolutely fascinating to me. And I asked our Chinese postdoc on the project, what's going on? And he said, oh, young Chinese people have heard all that kind of conversation talk before. There's nothing new about it. And they're participating in this because they care about it. And they're not going to let this guy derail it. He said, and it, the metaphor he used, I think, is so interesting for the topic of our discussion today. He said, it's like when you're surfing the web and you see like some inappropriate advertisement. I think he talked about pornography. Um, <laughs> pornography. And you just ignore it to focus on the content that you care about. Everybody in the digital space knows how to ignore things. And I thought that was just so fascinating. So ignoring as a political move. Um, so what we had here was a bunch of people who were committed to the, this, this project and saw this guy's comment not as a threat to them or something, but a threat to the platform. And they responded in a way that defended the platform and its future. So how do we interpret this episode and everything I've been telling you in light of the legal debate that we started with. Um, first, um, his libertarian, this guy's libertarian view um, did not prevail, right? His, um, his um, intervention, I think, whatever it was meant to do, failed, and he eventually kind of became silent. I guess he's still a member, but I haven't heard much from him in a long time. Uh, but at the same time, we, the group did not take the uh, Republican uh, deliberative position of regulating his speech either. Rather, this guy's speech ended up being beside the point because it was ignored by the group. And the more I think about this, I think that this idea of social ignoring is another response that we need to think much more seriously about when we think about how people, how pe real people in the world are dealing with the explosion of bad speech, right? That it's not, again, because here this is something that's not the state does it. It's not about banning or not banning, allowing or, or banning. It's about people socially just ignoring what they don't want to hear. Not denouncing, but ignoring. And that makes the speech beside the point, but also what it talks, what it raises, I think, for us to think about is the social skills involved in, in emerging social skills involved in being on platforms, which many of us are learning. And one of those skills is the ability to ignore, to refuse the clickbait, so to speak. And this might be something we want to think a lot more about as a tool of social engineering. <coughs> Second, um, we thought Meridian 180 was special because we had set up all these rules or put in place these technologies that would make sure that we weren't a free speech free-for-all. And what we learned from this episode was that Meridian 180 was special because the members were committed to the platform. And that it was the commitment of the members to the platform that saved the platform in that situation. And, um, and this, I think, is interesting because, as I said at the beginning, all of our thinking about free speech debates and its regulation online in the U.S. is still very much focused on the state and the role of the state and the state as a solution. But here what we're seeing is a group of people who come from very different states and very different kinds of political states 
who have a commitment to a new kind of social organization, the platform. And I don't think that any of us as law professors have thought very much about these institutions as sites of commitment, as, as sites in themselves that generate our commitment. And uh, as such, this could get us to, if we were to think more about platforms as places where people feel that they, wh where their identities are, 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 are defined, that define them, where they feel committed, um, we might begin to think more critically about different kinds of platforms. What's the difference between a Facebook and a Meridian 180? Um, um, what kinds of subjects, what kinds of committed subjects are they producing? One might actually be producing consumer, consumers or laborers, um, whereas another would be producing a different kind of identity. So to think about the platform as an important social institution, not just a way to get speech out there on the way of ch to changing the state, where we think the state is the most important institution. And the third thing that I want to leave you with is this idea that, um, that pe what people in Meridian 180 are telling us that they're doing is not just about citizenship, nor is it about consumerism, but it's about friendship. And, um, and so perhaps, um, you know, this very, really odd thing that people think they're producing, friendship, is something that deserves a lot more critical attention, both in law and in the social sciences. Maybe we do need a legal theory of friendship on par with our legal theory of citizenship, for example. That things, th as a phenomenon or kind of connection, uh, weak social ties outside existing economic or institutional or political groupings that we already know about. And to think about what are the conditions of friendship what is its significance for human dignity and human flourishing? And yes, for international and national politics. And so, th so the bottom line here that I want to leave you with is that um, I think there is a lot that we can be hopeful about in these spaces. But in order to be hopeful about them, we're going to have to think in different ways about what's going on in these spaces, what kinds of subjects are being produced, what kinds of collectivities are being produced, and, um, and what kinds of social skills are already at work in these spaces that provide a kind of local regulation apart from the regulation of law. So I'll stop there. Thank you. That's great. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, uh, so you're right. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure that the scale issue was the reason why people were able to ignore it in this case and not feel excluded and they wanted to quit. I think, I'm, I think perhaps if this particular individual had been, if there had been more of these people, 
you know, he wasn't the only one to speak. If there was, m if there was a sense that this is not just one person but a sizable group, right, then perhaps that would, that would have a different kind of social force behind it. And I think you're describing a situation in which it's not just one random person who's making a comment. It's uh, someone who has a lot of authority behind them or a big group behind them or who stands for, um, who stands for a collectivity that we have to be concerned about. So when the President of the United States is making racist comments on Twitter, that's different from someone else, right? I'm not thinking about the President of the United States. I'm thinking more of the Twitter egg, the idea that there is some anonymous person who created accounts simply because they didn't like what some person said. Right. And now they're going to repeatedly harass, harass that person. person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, one of the other things I think that we should think about is, you know, as you said, Twitter is a corporation that set up the ground rules in a way that made it very difficult for people to manage that on their own, right? So, I'm, so I think that the economics of these platforms relates to the governance structures that they have, right? And so, um, so this, I've described a platform which is really quite self-governed um, and which the members feel that they have confidence, I think, that they can intervene and change the governance structure or get involved in every level they want, whereas we don't feel that way about Twitter, right? So per perhaps part of the problem that you're describing is that we've, we have the wrong kind of platforms. And perhaps what this gets us thinking about is what would some different platforms that have different governance structures look like? Would that make any difference? So for example, in the anime situation, I think you might find something quite different than you find on Twitter, no? What do you think? Yeah. It's a small community, yes, but there's also an echo chamber yeah. that people might not even be willing to put out a comment in the first place because they have an idea of what the general sentiment within the community mm -hmm. is. So in that sense, it's different speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I think I really want to emphasize that that what made people feel invested in this platform was the work they did in creating it behind the scenes, right? Whereas I don't think that you and I feel that way about Twitter. Twitter belongs to Twitter, and, and all our investment is in, is in our comments on Twitter, right? So I don't really care whether Twitter survives or fails in some sense. It's not me. It's not me. Whereas, it's, so I think w one of the insights of this ethnographic material is that we need to not focus just on the speech and what is said and what the rules of the speech are, but on the infrastructure behind it and the economics of that infrastructure and the organizational structure and how much work people have to do to make the platform. Because it's that very ordinary work as much as the speech that determines the nature of the speech itself. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to build off of Great. what Grace uh -huh. is saying. And this might also be a factor of our age. Yeah. That, uh, this is stuff that we see a lot. But <clears throat> when we are discussing these platforms, I can't help but think they're not isolated Spheres. So mm. if, say, yep. someone sees something they're unhappy with, yeah. they'll pursue it through Twitter, through Facebook, through yeah. doxing, right. potentially, other means of spamming the person, examples of, say, a Nintendo translator who angers the fandom community. The community gets so involved and starts sending letters, yeah. tweets, right, yeah. uh, Facebook messages, yeah. and so on, and she ends up getting fired. Yeah. Right. because of the allegations that have been raised that the company doesn't want to hold up this person. Um, I think that we can't necessarily talk about ignorance when some people have their work is so in intimately connected to it. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at YouTubers, uh, Vine is no longer a thing. No. But <laughs> <laughs> people on Instagram, people who are personalities itself mm -hmm. on the internet mm -hmm. and need mm -hmm. that social connection. Mm -hmm. But is that different, do you think, than, than a situation of workplace harassment in the non-digital sphere? Well, is I there something new here? I, I think that part of the difference potentially is that this allows a lot of people who aren't even a part of the community necessarily to also come in and start making, uh, making these statements to start putting that influence through where folks find out that this has been going on recently, and I think this is a great example of your friendship mm -hmm. point. Last week was AGDQ, which I'm not going to get into all the details of it, but essentially it's a community of people who play video games as quickly as possible. 
They raised over $2 million for the Brain Cancer Foundation, and it's folks from around the globe, uh, many different languages who are getting together, and they just go over and they play games and raise money for it. And it's fantastic, but it caused a lot of controversy because it was done through Twitch, and they changed the Twitch stream, the chat, because it was full of uh, racist, racist, misogynistic, okay. transphobic content. Mm -hmm. And they made it subscriber only, you had to pay $5 to be a part of it, but you can communicate. People got angry, were hosting their own Twitch uh, mm -hmm. view, uh, streams mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. and immediately those chats started devolving mm -hmm. into racist, misogynistic, transphobic yeah. content, and other people started getting very angry and started spamming it and harassing yeah. streamers, the people involved behind EGDQ, and all these other aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Even though they were not themselves actually a part of that chat community, right. there were folks outside of it and angry about what was going on and still managed to make that known. So I just, although I absolutely agree that the platform itself and how it's structured will mm. affect how people communicate yeah. within it, yeah. these platforms themselves are not isolated bubbles. Mm -hmm. They still Very have interesting. other aspects mm -hmm. where those platforms interconnect mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. tweet something you saw on Facebook. You can yeah, go right. and those mm -hmm. platforms link amongst themselves. Yep, that's very interesting. That's so really that, no, I think that's a really interesting and great point. And so one of the things that maybe we need to study is the interface between those and who is working that interface. And it may be different people working different pieces of that interface, right? And when we think about this, so that what I'm describing is too uh, simplistic in a sense that it doesn't give us an ecosystem of platforms. A really, uh, as, as a picture of what's going on, right? Yeah, and I think that's really, I mean, it's, thank you, that's a really great point. And, I, and also, in fact, um, uh, I think that uh, one of the ways this is gonna be interesting in international law and international relations is the way those platforms start talking to each other and what people are doing in those spaces. So already, for example, around the North Korea issue, you see different platforms in Asia and elsewhere where people are beginning to have conversations across those platforms, as you say, and then that's, uh, in that particular example, serving functions that you're not seeing in the, in the you know, regular for, uh, international relations space. Um, so that deserves a lot more attention. And uh, you, know, you should do it. It would be great. <laughs> and I'll BC, is, uh, BC yeah. is next. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very uh, enlightening presentation. Um, two things occur to me as you, as you as you presented, uh, first is the is the idea of the network uh, and the to the platform. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I I thought whether you would entertain the idea that they still overlap uh, even so today. Interesting. Uh, uh, because conceptually, you, you yeah. can argue that uh, in networks, I use this in the context of recent and corruption work. Yeah. Uh, the notion of cooptation control yeah. uh, works in those platforms, but in that context, right? Uh, and so that even though we look at platform today, uh, in the context of your own project, for example, you yeah. have people who, who are there in pursuit of particular ideals, goals, and working right. towards a set of objectives. Right. Set of objectives. Right. So conceptually, I'm, uh, I'm just asking whether we would extend that idea that ultimately there's some overlap, although uh, ultimately it would appear the point is that technology has driven platform to a different uh, 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 scale. So that's the first big yeah. comment I'd like to make. The second, um, I, I think, dovetails what you've made. In the context of Twitter, I think there's, there's a mix, right? They put facilities in there that you can access. I may be a friend, but I may not see any posts from her for the next couple of months if mm -hmm. I don't want to, right? So I really like the idea of ignoring uh, as a political uh, move or tool of social engineering. I've done it sometimes. <laughs> racist things and you just mute, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to uh, to respond. So I think I like that idea and it speaks to 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 the fact that platforms such as Twitter uh, still have their use and people maybe have not also been as uh, opening and educated. These issues are emotional, they are mm -hmm. tough. Uh, but in some ways, uh, we have decisions to make that level. And lastly is the idea that yes, friendship, I think, have by far uh, create, have met people only, well, I've met them virtually for five years, and right. then eventually after five years, we meet at some conference and we talk as though 
you've met many, yes, many times, right? So uh, there's that community in there, uh, and it regulates, for example, how I engage uh, on those platforms uh, for myself. So uh, I find it very, very interesting. Interesting. And you're talking specifically in terms of anti-corruption networks? Yeah. I, oh, I'd like to hear more about that. I hope we can talk some more. Cause I, and fascinating that people are still talking about networks in that space, but that they're also talking about platforms, that they both exist, right, is what you're suggesting. Very interesting. I have to think more about that. That's great. I mean, I, my sense is that at least when, uh, the way people were talking about networks back in 2000, there was just this assumption that it just kind of happens. You know, like, I'll start networking with you, and you network with me, and pretty much, I mean, I was focusing on the women's movement, is what my research was, you know, that, and then pretty soon we'll be at the UN, and we'll change things, and there wasn't, that much attention to the, the nuts and bolts about how it was this assumption that you can just network, right? And not that, oh, there are actually all these impediments to everybody networking. Whereas this technology seems to be more, it's also very hopeful and kind of, you have a lot of, too much faith in it maybe, but there's still a focus on that problem of how do you, how do you actually do it, which is kind of interesting. Um, I, um, yeah, I, I think that maybe you're right that in a sense, it's easier to just mute somebody on a digital platform, to ignore someone on a digital platform than it is in real life, right? So if I say something offensive to somebody right here, they may feel compelled in person that they either have to respond or that if they don't respond, they're somehow coalescing, you know, agreeing with what I said. Whereas if I mute you, if I just ignore you on social platforms, I'm, I'm just getting you out of my life. So, I think you guys have a really good point that it's not that easy. I really, I really want to work with what you guys said, and I think you're absolutely right. But still, it's a counterintuitive move to say sometimes we can shut people out with these technologies. And if we simply, for example, I mean, I, I as thinking about this in terms of the political situation in the United States, which is my obsession at the moment, if we simply stopped paying attention to every tweet coming out of the White House, then the power of the White House would be very different than it is. And probably the most important political thing we could do would be to ignore, right? Mm -hmm. And yet that is so difficult to do, <coughs> right? And it requires actually a lot of ethical commitments. And what I described in terms of what our Chinese members did, I'm sure was quite hard for many of them to just say, I'm not gonna take the bait on this. I'm not gonna participate, right? So yeah, we don't wanna overstate the power of that, but it can be a counterintuitive move maybe. Yes? What will be the effect on our ability to watch what we want and ignore what we want by what Trump did last week in the reversing the... Um, You're talking about net neutrality. Control of the Great point. Great point. Right. Great point. Yeah. So, so that really brings us to the economics and the infrastructural quality of this, right? That, that it does make us realize that be, it's not just speech out there, that there are platforms that are, that are built on particular technologies that are owned by particular people and that how those nuts and bolts are put together matters to the conversation. And I still think that that could only happen because most people are still not conscious enough about that. They still are thinking, oh, I'm just talking, right? They're not thinking about everything that happens in the back room. So I think this is really important, your point, that it, it is gonna be harder to hear certain things, uh, potentially, and harder to get certain points of view, and easier, too easy to get other points of view because of this, this change to net neutrality. I mean, the history of what the big uh, net internet providers have done in the past should give us no confidence that they're gonna protect just do what's in the public interest here. Why would they, right? So this is really important, but I don't think most people are focused on it. So um, uh, it's... Uh, Many and of those internet providers likely to be political and speaking politically in the... Well, I, I think, you know, I, I'm not an expert on that, but my sense is that they're much more likely to be focused on the bottom line, that it's not so much about what's politically right or left. It's more about what's gonna make them money. And the fact is that what's gonna make them money is not my blog or your blog. Or it's, it's what you know, uh, Amazon has to say or something like that, right? And, and that itself is a problem for us. Um, um, so I see it more in, in terms of the economics than in the, the simple right-left politics. I don't know what you, 
Very interesting. So I think this links up with your point. Because what you're suggesting, I think, is really important, is that it's not ignoring in the abstract. There's a structure to the nature of the platform that makes that a viable strategy, uh -huh. right? And so then what I take from what you're saying is what we really need to be focusing on is not the strategy of any one individual, ignore, don't ignore, speak back, whatever, but what is the nature of the platform in which you're engaging? And Finding and creating, building and finding platforms which have a structure to them, economic and otherwise, which makes it possible for us to take risks and also ignore seems to be a really important political project, therefore. But then the point that you raised is that, that then, but then the problem is that, that they can become echo chambers and so forth. And so then your point is then what's really important is the linkage between these platforms there and the interface between them and how we how we start thinking about them as, as hooking up. So putting the three of you together, what I'm thinking about now is what if we start thinking about the public sphere as a networked space of platforms which have different structures to them and we start thinking about what would be the conditions for the networking between them but also the nature, the structure of different platforms that we would need so that people could have dignify conversations that would give them dignity and allow them to take risks, uh -huh. whoever they might be in those different spaces. But that's a totally different problem than the way free speech people talk about the problem, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right? It's much more institutional. It's much more focused on the sociology of what really goes on in these spaces. Um, and like you, I never cared about the free speech debate. It just bores me at some level, right? So. So then the, I think we need to think about why are we bored with it? Because there's probably a reason. What else, what are we missing? What is missing from that debate to make this a viable space in which we can think about a condition for a future that we want to live in, right? And so this has been really helpful. And you guys want to say more, so I want to hear more what, what you want to say. Good. <laughs> Can we give Brian a chance? Oh, yeah, and then, and then he wants to say something. Oh, yeah, okay, so Brian hasn't yeah. had a chance yet. I just want to make sure everybody gets one chance. 
You have right, right. But 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 then I start thinking, well, a couple of those people I do know, or I've I've been, I, I would call them friends, and now I'm watching how our conversation develops, and I can see like some people, like, this this was about this was about settler indigenous relations, yeah. And I can see how some people were like responding to my remarks, and suddenly we're we were starting. I could I felt a hostility coming at me, but then I had to I felt I needed to like adjust my speech so that I could continue the conversation. And then uh, that opens something else up. So eventually, we're, we're, we're becoming a little platform. Okay? And so I just want to say that. So the contrast between that two is kind of open and yeah. you know, sort of incipient, emergent uh -huh. platform yeah. that happens um, versus one that, right. is, that is born of uh, a, a moment like the tsunami and right. the Shimon and what have you. Um, and then the other thing is that quite often, just as a point, so sometimes friends on Facebook will, will say, hello, hi, Mike. And and you know I've got a problem. Can you can you contribute to this? And they'll ask those those who are, I don't know how to teach this course, or I don't know how to right, right. how to find a, right. a way to do right. uh, organic farming right. or something. Right. And then then people respond. So right. there's an, an assumption of hive mind being mm -hmm. a community of people who who occupy mm -hmm. the hive together and somehow are are amenable and and you're reaching out to this imagine of them as being connected yeah. and, and friends. Yeah. Or willing to have like a conversation yeah. That, yeah. that is not too dissonant enough that you could you could actually go back. So anyway, just some of the high points. How do you say high points? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think there there's. Um, there's another part of this book project that focuses on the whole fantasy of the collaborative economy now, right? Which fits in with that, right? Which is the idea that we've all lost faith in both the market and the state that regulates the market, and so now the the thing that gives us confidence is hive mind, right? That, right? That's, we've lost faith in science. We've got, so this idea of, uh, you know, if w collaboration emerging as the new thing we can actually believe in. Yeah. And I'm not for or against that. I just think it's a really important mm -hmm. social phenomenon mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that deserves probably more, th and there is some critical work. I mean, Beth popinelli has been working on that. Like different people are beginning to think Critically about why collaboration now? What does it make? What are the should we buy in? Should we be in favor of it or against it? What should be the what are the dimensions of that? Right. Um, 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 I so I think you're talking about that sort of crowdsourcing idea as a, a place of not just friendship but producing something of value, right? Producing an answer. And, um, and it is, I think it is very connected to that. Uh, and it's also connected to your point about what are we actually doing in this space. Um, I, just one thing on the friendship thing. I, I'm agnostic about whether you guys are friends in that space. That would be up for you for to decide. All I'm trying to say is the friendships that I've seen emerge are not between the people talking online inside Meridian 180. I think they're actually quite, quite weakly connected to one another. And they're just speech nodes. The friendship is the people who are actually volunteering their time and building something. And that's a very ordinary, very, very practical thing. And it's something anthropologists can study, have been studying for years in the anthropology bureaucracy, right? So, 
And I think that that's a dimension of this that gets overlooked in the ideology of online connections, is that there's a lot of pretty ordinary uh, labor that has to go into it. And that has interesting political effects that we might want to think more about. So I'm interested in the distinction yeah. between what's friendly and what, what's friendship. Right? Yeah, well. Yes, 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 very helpful. Thank so you. So we've got about five minutes left. John, and then we'll yeah. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, first of all, I want to say a really interesting presentation. Um, like Kim, there's a lot of uh, layers, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around, but. Me too. Uh, so. <laughs> Maybe, let me, uh, I fear that I might repeat some of what's said already, but, but let me try to spin it into a more pointed question. So I took you, so first of all, I think this is interesting, an interesting platform that you built. Uh, I know you you come from the international space, so it reminds me a little bit of ICANN. It's been sort yeah, of a yeah, multi-stakeholder yeah. uh -huh. model. Yeah, right, right, right. For internet governance, it's yeah. a multi-stakeholder yeah. model for pro uh, solving problems. Yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting because a, uh, a lot of the problems we see with these platforms um, are private platforms in ways yep, that right. the most important public spheres today are kind of like yep. quasi-public spheres. They're yep. not public, really. Yep. They're private platforms governed by companies. Right. Um, and so you have this platform, but I took you to say, here's an ethnographic case study on this platform, in which I'm using as a case study and extrapolating from this community. So maybe more generalizable pro uh, problem solving ideas for what we're seeing as problems on other kinds right. of platforms, right? So where you see online harassment is a big problem on Twitter as a platform. Uh, on Facebook where you right. have um, you know, fake news and disinformation right. spreading. Um, and I think this, this brings us back to some of the concerns that were being raised already. So yeah. if you think of ignoring as maybe a more generalizable solution to other platforms, yeah. Inevitably, it takes us back to the particular platforms themselves and their design and how they're governed. Yep. And yep. the private, the companies trying yep. to make exactly. money. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and I think your response was, well, you're not concerned with Twitter. If Twitter dies tomorrow, that's fine. But then I wonder then is, uh, if in fact your solutions are going to be generalizable to other platforms, um, how can we ensure platform accountability right. in these companies? Implement them. Right. That's one And if, if, if the, or is it that you're saying that in order for your solutions to succeed, you need to abandon those platforms, move to something like Meridian One Eight, mm -hmm. uh, which is a different design and a different community. And then my concern there is, is how realistic is that? Yep. Given network effects. Yep. Given that there's moats been built around all yep. of these existing platforms. Yeah. So and who's going to, will everyone even have a space in that world, right? Exactly. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so I don't know, <laughs> is what I would say to you. I think those are all really good points. I mean, to me, what all this suggests is that if the lawyers are focusing on the conditions for speech, should we regulate it or not, maybe we should spend our, more of our attention focusing on how do we regulate Facebook, right? And the conditions of those platforms. So that it's really about, should there be rules as to what Twitter can or can't do if this space is so important to us now, right? And that's a conversation that's just beginning to happen in the US and Congress, like just beginning, but mostly around more whether they're a news organization or, a con you know, or just a content provider, you know, something like that. Whereas opposed to, no, 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 you are the public sphere now. <laughs> and if you are the public sphere, we've always regulated you know, uh, television companies, we've always regulated, uh, why, why would there not be, why couldn't we start to think about rules around governance structure, for example, for these kinds of organizations when they get large enough that they have a huge stake? So that's something I'd like to think more about. Um, but I think your other question is a really good one. Is it really realistic to imagine we're gonna have a bunch of artisanal platforms emerging everywhere, mom and pop platforms that we all can participate in and link them up? Is that just a total fantasy? You know, or is it something that a bunch of elite people who have access to a lot more resources than everyone else can do? I can do this, even though it's really hard for us too, but you know, as compared to somebody you know, else, that's perhaps, you know, I think those are really good questions. And um, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I think you're raising the right questions that we need. Those, that, but the point is, that's a different set of questions than what we're talking about right now, at least, it seems to me.
just one tiny yeah. suggestion. Yeah. Uh, have you spoken with Eden Zuckerman at MIT Media Lab about his role with I Everyone says I need to meet him. Yeah, yeah. You need, Everyone. You need, talk, you need to talk to Ethan about okay. his voices. It's very Do you know similar. him? You should also talk to uh, Nathan Matias. Uh, he's a collaborator of mine. He's just started a nonprofit based also at MIT Center for oh. Civic Media called Citizen DHS, or sorry, Civil Servant. It focuses on using researchers like myself. I'm uh, involved in some of these projects, helping sort of these online communities, uh, building research so they can use it for platform. Wow, so interesting. Talk very exciting. And talk to Ethan. Thank you very well, much. We'll give Michelle a round of applause. <laughs> I was especially taken by your comment on ignoring the social strategy um, because I have you know, much of what you talked about in this really interesting platform, of course, it does look outside of itself for validation. And it's interesting that when there was trouble on the platform, you were asked to telephone the trouble. Yes, yes. Uh, you yes. showed a photograph of yes. everybody meeting in person, person right. after they had done the work together. Yes. There's the issue yes. of the purchase and sale and exactly. the modification. So there's obviously a surrounding Outside. context to what I worry about, but frankly, um, you, you talk about your speech as not being exceedingly you know, of interest, and yet the whole concept of pipeline is really putting back, it's going right back to the value of free speech as standing by, yes, this has a value in itself. I mean, free speech, there mm -hmm. is there is a communal wisdom mm -hmm. which comes right. out of right. free speech. I mean, parts of it may be indigestible, obviously, but <laughs> Don't have to do anything more. I mean, there's most recent yeah. election to my mind in the United States was very much mm -hmm. a contest between traditional media and social media, mm -hmm. and social media won. It's the fragmentation mm -hmm. of this of this world, mm -hmm. the fragmented world versus mm -hmm. a a high flying world, no matter what the world is using right now, mm -hmm. which uh, was really at stake. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing fragmentation and polarization in and out. But the thing that really, really hit me most of all is the comment that you made about ignoring as a political move. More and more frequently, I find people telling me that they have written letters, made phone calls, sent emails, all these traditional things, working with us here outside of the political media to people who actually have a non social media. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Right. 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 So if ignore right. is yeah. going to be the relationship, I would say, you know, you talk about the fact that there are defined relationships and there are defined responses. But if no if ignoring is going to become an accepted response, it needs to be a counter response. Right. Because what people can't tell is the difference between yeah. were they unheard? Yeah. Were they unnoticed? Yeah. Very interesting. Or were they not? Very interesting. Very interesting set of comments. Very, you said about 12 or 15 really interesting, <laughs> important <laughs> things. Um, so one, I just want to be clear. I, I wasn't saying I'm not interested in free speech in general. No, I think no, the comment I was no, I the comment see. was about that I was agreeing with was about the way the free speech debate is framed in legal studies. Uh, yes which is, becomes very almost dweeby into my mind and doesn't get to what's interesting about free speech. So that, that was, um, and I think the wider point that you're making is one that I was trying to raise, but I think I need to do a better job of raising it, which is that, yes, we cannot think of this stuff as separate from what goes on not on the platform, right? That it's the interface, and in fact, the stuff not on the platform is more important in this world, right? Like you said, that's why I was showing pictures of people actually interacting is what's really important. So, so we want we don't want to fetishize the online stuff and not realize the other stuff is very important. 
The third point that I take from you that I think is really important is um, ignoring in a context of hierarchy, we need to think about the hierarchies that exist when people ignore. So it's one thing for us to ignore some sort of hate speech. It's another thing to be ignored by our elected officials, right? And that's a, that, that when there's a hierarchy there, we're talking about something very different in quality. And that we need to have some sort of sociological understanding of those hierarchies that not all ignoring is the same, right? <laughs> Um, and I think someone else made that point, I think you made that point, that, that it was, uh, you know, th there's a social structure here that makes this work as a democratic move that might not exist, that certainly wouldn't exist in relationship to our public officials. But the other thing I got from your comment that was really helpful to me is I, to understand why is ignoring so powerful? Because the person who was ignored doesn't know why they were ignored. They don't even know if they were ignored. They just don't know whether there was a glitch well, the message never got there, it's different from being refuted, being told that you're wrong, right? It's just vague. And so that's very, very interesting. And that, I think, is harder to do in a face-to-face -face situation. You know, there's all kinds of cues. You know if I'm ignoring you, right? You know what I mean? Whereas if it's online, there's the time difference. There's, it's much harder, but not just online. It's also true with letters. It's true with all the old technologies. So then that makes us think, what's really new here? How much of this is new and how much of it is an old problem, right, in that respect? But those are really, I'll, I'll think a lot more about that. So thank you very much for this critique. So. Okay, well, um, yes. we could, it's clear we could carry <laughs> on. And so what I'm going to say to Professor Rose is that she wants to save a few more minutes so that after we adjourn, people who might have some questions please, please, can talk to her. Or uh, I have questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I knew before this happened, I was already thinking of ways we could get Professor Rose to come back in the next and contribute, and having heard this, I can see now that there's just so much potential. And so we'd love to have you back. And so we have this uh, oh, little, how pretty. Thank you. little uh, token of our Beautiful appreciation. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thanks thank so you. Thank you. On such uh, a topical Thank issue. you so much. Thank you for your help. Yeah, it's really appreciated very much.